Thank you. Thank you very much. OK. Well, I'm going to try to turn the lights down so you can see the slides. Thank you for this kind introduction. And um, also, thank you for coming. There are many people here from uh, around, and I'll, I'll bring, hopefully, highlight some of, of you. I, I may not highlight everybody that I've interacted with in the room here, but I appreciate your coming and some of you from very long distances. Let's see if this does what I think it should do. It should darken the room a little bit. OK. So you've heard the title of my talk, and I'll talk about a variety of things in nanotechnology. Uh, I just wanted to make a comment about Alvin Stiles. He was a, uh, at the University of Delaware, and we overlapped. And uh, I knew him only through interactions in the hallway, and I knew about some of his work in catalysis. He worked on nylon. And there's uh, some old pictures from the DuPont company on the, the starting of nylon. Uh, there are a couple of places where we interacted also professionally through some of the research that I've done, not only through the DuPont company sponsorship, some of my students went to DuPont to actually support the, the company's effort in, in the area of the nylon polymer as well. And I'm very grateful to, to him for, for this opportunity to, to uh, have a fellowship in his name. Now, the University of Delaware is an interesting place. I've been here 15 years. And there have been a couple of other newsworthy items that appear every now and then in the update. And this one in particular got me a bit scared in 1999 because whether it was intentional or whether it was Bill Gates uh, uh, not recognizing my favorite word as part of the English language, uh, I was expected to lecture on theology of concentrated dispersions. So I, of course, invited Monsignor Zuper here today. Thank you for coming <laughs> to make sure that I get my theology right. <laughs> so, OK. But I think what that word was supposed to be was rheology. And since I only get to do this probably once, you know, to give a lecture in front of the uh, open lecture in front of the university, I thought I'd make sure that we're all um, uh, understanding what exactly rheology is. And you're not supposed to read all that. But it is, as Eric said, the study of, of deformation and flow of matter. Now, there's one gentleman in the room here who will correct my history of rheology, and that's Professor Art Metzner, an emeritus professor in our department, who really founded rheology as a field, one of the founders, and certainly is uh, the person who made Delaware uh, one of the premier uh, places for rheology. I also know we have some of my uh, colleagues from TA Instruments who are here in the, in the audience as well, which is probably the world's leading company in rheology, which is in Newcastle, Delaware. So if you think rheology, you should think Del uh, uh, Delaware. From an epistemological standpoint, rheology is very interesting because it started on a particular day at a particular place. So if you go to the Oxford English Dictionary, you'll find uh, this uh, uh, beginning of rheology as a word was sort of invented by a number of scientists who called themselves rheologists in Columbus, Ohio on April 29th. And, and at the NBS, which is now NIST, and we have a group of people here from NIST, uh, became uh, the science that we know it now, uh, it, it was sort of institutionalized through the Society of Rheology. And Art, you can correct me at any time when I get some of this wrong. Um, but the, the, the motto, uh, OK, so this is, this is a sort of a black art rheology. And so we have symbols, and we have our, our hourglass here. And, and the motto, everything flows, which I'm going to refer to a couple times during this lecture, uh, goes back to Greek times. And you can read the little history here of Heraclitus and, and what he said about things being an illusion and all things in flux. But the idea of rheology is the study of, of how things flow and deform. And keep that in mind. We'll come back to that in a little while. What do we do in rheology? So we start with a sample. And we'll talk a lot about this particular material today. We put it in an instrument and interrogate it. And for the people here from TA Instruments, they can tell us that those instruments are very expensive and sensitive. We collect experimental data, which become a fingerprint, if you will, of, of the material. We then like to compare that to molecular models or theory, or directly use that data in a variety of different tasks as rheologists. Now, I apologize to my colleagues in rheology, Anthony Barris, Annette Schein, and others in the department, uh, for my sort of simplification of the field. But we try to engineer products. We try to ask basic scientific questions about the material. And rheology is also a discovery, as we'll see today. It's a vehicle for discovery. And I'm, before I come to this slide, let me say, <laughs> Very happy to, to, to have a, a, a great support from the university for our rheological measurement science laboratory. We have now well over a million dollars worth of equipment, and there are about 14 research groups around campus that use that. And it becomes a, a vehicle or a window for me to learn about new science. We're constantly having people coming in with strange and exotic materials, hydrogels and tissues and whatnot, trying to measure them, or my friends in civil engineering 
where we probably don't like them coming in with some of the sludge samples that they've got, uh, but some other materials and that. So it's a wide ranging science and you'll see some of that as I go along. Okay, believe it or not, this was me and uh, I wanted to point out some things that you should be careful what you say, right? And so the update uh, uh, did an article when I came and, and uh, so they got me in front of the blackboard and they, there were a couple things that I wanted to point out on a more serious note. So I was talking about what I wanted to do here. And one thing I wanted to do was to look at how the flow and structure of fluids are related, how we can control the structure during processing to cre create desirable properties. And I was talking about liquid crystal polymers and how they were. And my first few students, who you'll meet shortly through the slides, uh, worked on with DuPont and the National Science Foundation on L liquid crystal polymers. The other thing I've circled here, at the end of that, I was talking about as an application composites or bulletproof vests. Then another topic which I had students working on, my first graduate students, were ceramic materials, in particular colloidal materials that make up ceramics. And at the time, I told the reporter, and she did a very nice job, Cornelia Weil, in writing about it, so I'm look, not looking at applications. And the goal is to understand the fundamentals. And the story I want to tell you today, I think I also want to make a pitch for the need in this country to fund basic science. Although we'll end up, hopefully, with something interesting called STF Armor, it didn't start that way uh, 15 years ago, okay? It started as basic science with no idea where we were going. Interestingly enough, if you put together the liquid crystal polymers, that's Kevlar, with the ceramic slurries, the colloidal dispersions I'll show you, you end up where, where we are today. And I'll talk a lot about that as we go along. Some of my early students who I'm very grateful for, Lynn Walker is at Carnegie Mellon, and Maria Rivera van Eindhoven, married a Dutchman and is now in DSM, but she worked on, on nyl uh, nylon rheology of these nylon polymers at the experimental station. Johan Bergenholtz is a professor in Sweden, and he's um, now a, f a junior fellow of the Swedish Royal Society. Bill Koenig is a GE. Uh, Tom Cuthbert's uh, uh, gainfully employed at Dow. And you'll see John Bender again, who's now a professor at South Carolina with his own research group. And then just a flash of some of the students that then uh, carried uh, some of these ideas forward, and some of them are in the audience here, and thank you for coming. Okay, so. After doing this basic science, we were uh, worried about some problems and through our Center for Composite Materials and the Army Research Lab, and I'll introduce you to some of those people, some of whom are here today, uh, we learned things about uh, a particular problem, that uh, the uh, area, the problems associated with landmines, and also a problem that was brought to our attention, this is actually a more recent article, but it illustrates the problems associated with casualties of our soldiers and the location of uh, injuries. And so from the current Iraqi freedom operation, in a very short time, looking at the injuries, what you find is that they're uh, predominantly in the legs, and then there's some head and neck, and then smaller numbers in the chest and abdomen. And what's interesting, if you just pull out from the conclusion of this report by the surgeons, what's going on, said most injuries are to the extremities. And this is true in all recent military uh, campaigns, as well as, as earlier campaigns. And it's about 60 to 70 percent uh, of all the injuries. And this really goes back almost to Civil War times. And they highlight the fact that the, in modern times, this is really due to the, the very good, high quality modern body armor that protects the head and the chest and the torso, but not the arms and legs and the extremities. And so that's, that's something important to think about. So rather than let me tell you about this technology, I'll ask Vince Dementri from NBC10, who came to the university and interviewed us, tell us a little bit about the technology. Until now, imagine a Kevlar suit. Could even be this one. Lightweight, flexible, and it protects the wearer against bullets and bomb fragments. When bombs go off in Iraq and Afghanistan, too often, these are the grim results. For later on. 
meaning whole uniforms can be made to better protect all the soldiers so that the only thing they leave behind in war is the loneliness, not arms and legs, fingers and toes. It's a little more poetic, but this part gets scary because they did a live demo, actually. We hope to have this in service in the military by the year 2006, late next year. Right? Yeah, let's do a live demonstration. This is four pieces of ballistic Kevlar. You can see lawsuit coming, right? <laughs> Now this is the tree of Kevlar. Okay. You're going to have to hold it down. Oh, oh no. Stab away. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it gets worse. <laughs> yeah, I know. Let me stop right here. Same thing. Same Kevlar, four sheets with this liquid armor. And what's great about it, it's flexible. So you can protect the limbs. No, no, because it's so much stronger and so much lighter. You don't have to make gloves out of it. You can make uniforms out of it. So when you so when you see these these poor soldiers, men and women with a lot of limbs. The whole point of that is so that you don't Vince, see Vince was pretty excited actually when he came down and spent time. <laughs> Surprised they didn't pull him off the stage at the end. Yeah. Okay, well, so that was that was that story, and uh, you know he, he did a, a, re, a very good job of, of also not not reporting on the dumb things that I said, you know, the interview and on. And I'd like to acknowledge then that this work was was uh, uh, co-invented and co-developed with the Army Research Lab and Dr. Eric Wetzel, who's actually a graduate of the University of Delaware uh, uh, from the mechanical engineering here with a bachelor's degree, and is now at the Army Research Lab in Aberdeen, and he's in the audience here somewhere, so you get a chance to meet him and he can probably correct me on some of the things that I say. And our team uh, were awarded the SIPL Award from the US Army for this work in 2002. Okay, so I've gotta spend a few slides telling you a little bit about the science behind what we're doing. And to do that, let me talk a little bit about house paint. Now, there's nothing like watching paint dry, but if you look at the mechanical properties, the rheology of house paint, and the different curves here are different concentrations of the particles in the house paint, at rest, you want a house paint that's basically a gel, that the particles don't settle out on you. And when you pour it, you want it to flow. So you want that to flow like a liquid. But what you don't want is this shear called shear thickening phenomena. So we're talking about shear thickening, where the viscosity, which I think we all have some rough idea of what viscosity is, uh, the viscosity goes shear thins, but then it shear thickens. This is very undesirable if you want to brush a house paint or, or coat paper or process a ceramic material. And this is where we started with the NSF, thinking about, and various industries, thinking about how to eliminate shear thickening when you have a processing problem where it occurs and you don't want it to happen. And the basic understanding is captured perhaps in this cartoon. At equilibrium, this is an electron micrograph of colloidal particles. They're smaller than a human hair by quite a bit. And if I put them in solution, Brownian motion keeps them in solution suspended, and they have a fairly high viscosity. And that's shown down here. And as I make them shear, they tend to collide with each other, but they also tend to follow each other down the streamlines, much the same way that cars tend to follow each other on the highway. The fewer collisions mean the viscosity is lower, the material flows more easily. But due to very interesting phenomena associated with fluid mechanics, the particles form these clusters at high rates of deformation, and the viscosity goes back up. And I've highlighted the particles here because this is a particular conformation where the clusters are spanning the cell of the device, and they're exerting very high stresses in the material. And so it's this transition from a fluid to these clusters and back, which is what we're looking at in this phenomenon, which is responsible for the energy absorption of this material, as well as the ability of the material to withstand very high stresses. If the particles are made out of ceramics, like what I'm showing you, you basically have a material that starts to respond more like a ceramic solid. And I have a jar of the material up here, and you can play with it. You can tip it and see it flows, and, and you'll see it jam up like that. Why is this? Well, I won't go into the great details, but there were simulations uh, of this uh, phenomena done at Caltech. And my first graduate student, John Bender, and I started looking into uh, seeing if we could devise new rheological tests to actually work this out. And in a rheometer, you can basically only measure the total viscosity. And this is, 
actually happens to be a TA Instruments instrument for you guys uh, from TA, and that we have, and it could measure this viscosity. But we had to develop new experiments based on real optics where we combine rheology with laser light scattering, and as I'll show you later on, neutron scattering, to measure the structure of the fluid and work out what parts of, of the uh, viscosity or where they're coming from, where this viscosity increase is coming from. And in fact, what we were able to show was that there was this structural transformation because it showed up in the laser light scattering, and we could quantify the fact that this structural transformation was driving this increase in viscosity. This made John Bender very happy, and he graduated with his PhD, uh, one of my first students. And I think it made his wife even more happy. She was waiting for him to finish. You know, It took a long time to build the instrumentation and make it work. It's an interesting phenomenon because it's not just particles touching each other and aggregating. This is completely reversible. And it's a phenomenon which, interestingly enough, we've known about for uh, more than 100 years. In the 1880s, a gentleman by the name of Reynolds, a scientist, was studying bearings and lubrication flows and bearings. And most of us came here in cars, or maybe on a bicycle, or maybe on a rollerblades, somewhere, something that had a wheel. And in the wheel, there, we all know their bearings, and the bearings, they're metal pieces separated by fluid. And very thin layers of fluid keep the bearing, which maybe has the entire weight of this car, uh, separated from the housing, if you will, which has the car on it, and the, this part is the axle uh, connected to the wheel. And they're separated by this thin film of fluid. And as you try to squeeze this fluid together, the equations that Reynolds and then Sommerfeld, some famous eminent scientists at the turn of the 1900s, um, turn of the 20th century, developed a theory to describe the pressure that's exerted in this fluid. And it could be extremely high. And in fact, what's really fascinating to me, and what we didn't believe at first, was that as you drive the size of the features from ball bearings, which are centimeters in size, smaller and smaller to microns in size, to even nanometers in size, this hydrodynamic phenomena still exists. And as the colloidal particles are driven together, as I show you in this cartoon, if I don't have this phenomena, two particles in a flow field will just see one another and move apart. But if they come close together, they become strongly correlated due to this thin liquid film in between them. You may have experienced this if you try to take two pieces of glass slides or something and push them together in water. It's very hard to squeeze out that last amount of water. When it's squeezed together, it's also very hard to separate the glass slides. And this is a similar phenomenon. And so these particles become bound together and form the nucleus of these clusters. So by understanding this physics, we could then begin to predict it. And in fact, these ideas were resident in the literature in some of the fundamental colloid physics that goes back to the Cambridge Fluid Mechanics Group. Now, we do a lot of fluid mechanics uh, in the Department of Chemical Engineering, and I just wanted to highlight some of our other fluid mechanics seminars that we have every spring on the Brandywine River. Uh, also embarrass a few of my students here. So with that, OK. So the idea then is that we have this material which transitions, and on a rheometer we can measure this, composed of these colloidal materials. We can then, I had to show one equation, Eric, develop uh, theoretical models to, to describe this. Uh, I started working on these equations when I was a graduate student at Princeton. I'm still working on these equations. It has convinced me that you really need to work closely with mathematicians. Uh, but these equations essentially predict this phenomena that I'm showing you here, which is really useful because if it's an engineer, if you have a mathematical description, then you can begin to control and manipulate the phenomena to move it where you want it or eliminate it when you don't want it. And I'd like to highlight some of the students who, after John Bender worked on this, Brent Maranzano, who's now at Roman Haas, Sadir Shinoy is now at Schlumberger, Ron Egris, who's at DuPont in Richmond, working on the new uh, version of Kevlar, the M5, and Lakshmi Krishnamurti, who's at Central Research and Development, also working in DuPont and uh, Protective Materials, and Lakshmi's here today. Thank you for coming. OK, so there's a large team of people whenever you start in any endeavor. And I'm only showing you the UD team plus Dr. Eric Wetzel, who has a group of very talented scientists and engineers at the Army Research Lab. If those of you who don't know, it's in Aberdeen, Maryland, 26 miles away. And uh, through the auspices of the Composite Center Center of Excellence, we were working on this technology uh, together. Uh, let me highlight a few of the people here. These are two undergrads, the Kirkwood brothers. Uh, they're actually twins. And uh, Keith is now at Santa Barbara and is a sponsored athlete as well in chemical engineering as a graduate student. Uh, he's also an Ironman. And his brother John is equally good in athletics and is at Stanford doing his PhD. Uh, Ron, as I mentioned, is at DuPont. Phil Matthews was a UD undergrad, is now at City College. And uh, Young Su Lee is now at Samsung in Korea. He's uh, was a postdoc. Current students working on the project, who you'll see, Dr. Carolyn Nam and uh, is a postdoc working with me. Uh, uh, Matt Decker will be working with the Gore Company when he graduates this spring. 
And Dennis is a uh, new PhD student in his second year. And uh, you'll see around also Ben uh, Schiffman and Joe Houghton, who are uh, Kemi undergrads. And let me tell you a little bit about the story of what we did. OK. The idea then is to take these fluids, which turn from a liquid to a solid under high rates of deformation or stress, and to make a composite material. Composites, by definition, are things, well, you would hope, where you can use two materials or more and get more from them, that the whole is better than the sum of its parts. So by integrating a composite such, uh, into a composite, the shear thickening fluid, we could take, for example, a, a material that's a known ballistic material like Kevlar, works very well against some threats, and impregnate it with the shear thickening fluid, stop bullets, make materials from it. Uh, this fluid is, as you'll see on the desk up here, a nice liquid. You can roll it around and, and flow it. But when you try to pick it up quickly with a spatula in it or something, it solidifies and supports stress. And the kind of fabrics that we're talking about, we've looked at Kevlar and a wide variety of other fabrics, but they're woven materials. The fluid, by the way, has more than 50% solids in it, which is sort of amazing that it flows in the first place. And then these nice electron micrographs uh, show you that the fluid, these are the weave of the yarn. And inside each yarn are these filaments. And at a finer level are the particles. And there's no fluid here because of the electron microscope burns it out. It has to be done. It's a very uh, aggressive uh, technique. But you can see that we intimately contact these. So as the, the fabric moves, the fluid is experiencing forces. And under impact, it responds. And working with Eric Wetzel and scientists at the, at the Army Research Lab and as well as people in our composite center, developed the test matrix. We've done ballistics, pullout, flexibility, and stab to look at the properties. And I'll just show you one or two results. Um, here's Eric demonstrating that his spike is very sharp. And this is sort of like the, uh, the ice pick test uh, that we have. He developed a very nice uh, uh, test associated with NIJ. And all I want to point out to you is this is very nasty. And there are lots of sharp things here. Then, and what's, what you do is you put your target or your material on top of essentially foam with a variety of layers of what are called witness paper. And as the, tar as the penetrator goes through, you just count how deep it goes. And if you're wearing this, you hope the answer is zero, right? OK. So at low energies, what we find is that 15 layers of Kevlar is very easily penetrated by that ice pick, just as you saw Renee do on MBC 10. You know, she stabbed right through it. Uh, on the other hand, if I take 12 layers of the treated material that has the same weight as the 15, at low energies, there's no penetration. And at higher energies, as we drop it from a higher height or we add more weight to the spike, eventually the spike is bent. Here, by the way, once you get through five, we stop counting because you're probably dead, so you don't care. Uh, so the technology works, as you saw in the video, and also in the laboratory to show that, that it absorbs the energy and prevents things from going through. I'll just show you one example of some of the diagnostics that we do afterwards, because I think it speaks towards how this technology works. And what we've done here is Carolyn Nam, who's very good with the electron microscope, has looked very closely at the material. And what you see here, after testing, you'll see the particles. And again, these are, are much finer than a human hair, so you need an electron microscope to see this. And these are a piece of the Kevlar, which is normally smooth, the individual filaments, is now grooved. And you can see how the particles have grabbed a hold of the fabric to prevent it from moving and preventing things from penetrating through. And you can see over here how the uh, material's been plastically deformed. DuPont didn't believe this at first, that the Kevlar could actually be plastically deformed. So we're, we're able to really absorb the energy, deforming the target, uh, breaking particles uh, and, and things, rather than the, the, the person behind it. And that's the goal. OK. We've done other. Um, NIJ, National Institute of Justice level testing. I'll just talk about these FSPs because they're an interesting uh, threat. When a grenade goes off or a landmine goes off, you often get sharp metal fragments. And the Kevlar bulletproof um, vests were really designed for police use originally, where you have soft lead projectiles. And so it's very hard to stop these sharp metal fabrics. Let me just show you the, the videos. You saw, sort of saw part of that, whoop, sort of part of that before. Maybe I can show you the videos. Let me find my mouse. Here we go. So what you see here is th three layers of Kevlar. These were taken at the Army Research Lab using their high-speed camera, which allows us to also begin diagnosing what's going on in here. And you can see this, this, is a, this turns out to be a soft lead projectile. And it's going right through the uh, Kevlar. And it's coming at about 1,200 feet per second. So that's about the speed of sound. And over here, you can see the treated material, the same three layers of Kevlar, the same projectile, and a very different result. 
And it sort of illustrates how the energy is being absorbed. We're not penetrating through the fabric. And if you look in detail, you can see how the shock wave moves out. And, and you can learn something about how the fabric is fundamentally altered in this composite structure, which is what we're after. Okay. All right. Back to theology, rheology, and everything flows. Uh, another uh, uh, tradition we have is on Earth Day, and, and every uh, spring we go on hikes. And uh, Professor Russell can probably remind me what the name of this uh, outcropping of rock is, because this ho house is built on a similar one. This is in the White Clay Creek Park. Many visitors from uh, the Netherlands and Belgium and Germany and other places pictured here, and some current and former students. But if you claim, as a rheologist, that everything flows, uh, and you look at these rocks, you've got a problem, right? Does, does everything flow? And, and I didn't worry about this originally. Uh, I have to point out that, that I think Professor Metzner must have worried about this and others historically because if you go to Colburn Lab, this is a picture of Colburn Lab on Academy Street, you'll find what look like crypts, what look like burial plots out front. There's the names of Colburn and the dates and Pigford and the dates, the eminent people who started our department. But there are also these symbols. And this one in particular I want to call your attention to is the Deborah number. DE, and it's a ratio of t the time of observation and the time uh, with which the material uh, changes its properties. And it turns out the Deborah number is very important to this rheology community because of the idea that everything flows. And if you want to go take a look, uh, you'll see it's engraved on the front of the building. And you know, things that are chiseled in stone are probably right, right? So we should believe this. Um, but what uh, Professor Marcus Reiner wrote in a, in a review back in 1964 in Physics Today was that there was this difficulty. Do, does everything flow? Are we, we right as rheologists? And this uh, interesting symbol on the front of our building really comes back to a, a saying that has to do with the prophetess Deborah. And so the idea is that Deborah knew two things, if you read the Old Testament. And she said that the mountains flow as everything flows. But secondly, that they flowed before the Lord and not before man, for the simple reason that man in his short lifetime cannot see them flowing. So a lot of rheology is associated with understanding measurements and time scales as well as material properties. And we could be looking at geological time scales. We can be looking at very fast events, as I've shown you with these bullets here. And I invite you to look at the other seven symbols on the front of our building and find out what they mean, too, as well. Quite interesting. OK. Uh, I'm happy to report that through the uh, university and the UD Tech Corp, uh, and in the inspired leadership there, Carolyn Thorogood and, and uh, uh, Bruce Morrissey, our new lawyer, and Dick Holston and others, and Fraser Russell starting us off, uh, we've been able to uh, license the technology to a major company who make a lot, wide variety of things here. And so we're looking forward to partnering with them over the next few months to actually turn what I've shown you, what we have here on the tabletop, uh, to something hopefully that's useful to, to a variety of applications, both civilian and military. And we also have another partnership with the Dow Chemical Company. And for those of you who've ever had small animals biting through your uh, cables, uh, someday maybe that'll be a thing of the past due to the incorporation of shear thickening fluid type materials into a wide variety of, of things for automotive and cable and other uses. So we're very happy to have these two corporations working with us at the university on that. I'd also like to mention that there's significant interest in, for various groups at NASA uh, those of you who have been reading the science literature, there have been a number of interesting studies recently about the effects of orbital debris and micrometeorites. Uh, and if we're going to go to Mars, we need protection once we leave the Earth's magnetic field. And this is a candidate for that as well. OK. Uh, that's enough on STF armor. I want to take just a few minutes to tell you about a few other projects that we're working on. Just a few slides. Uh, the group from NIST is here, uh, unexpectedly but nicely, the National Institute of Standards and Technology. And in fact, I wanted to highlight some of the new things that we're doing jointly between the U of D and there. Uh, as I showed you early on, our ability to put laser light scattering together with rheology taught us a lot about materials. And now if we take neutron scattering, and this is Ron Egris working on the neutron line, uh, working with scientists at NIST, Lionel Pocar and Paul Butler and others who are here, we've been able to develop uh, these experiments on these major beam lines. You need a nuclear reactor for this experiment, so it's not something you can do in my lab. Uh, but we go down there and work with them. And in fact, as you see, they even let me touch things down there, which is nice. Okay. So, and that's the kind of technology that we're working on, the ability to look at materials underflow, look at their structure using light and neutron scattering. And that spills over into another interesting project that we're doing with Pam Cook and Eric Kaler and Pam's student. Uh, Pam's in the math department, her student Paula. Uh, these guys are wandering around here from NIST, so you'll see them. Uh, 
a very talented undergraduate, Andrew Klein, who I think will go into theater if he doesn't get a chemie job, and Bess Schubert, who's, sorry, Andrew, uh, and Bess Schubert, who's now, uh, a, was a PhD student here with Eric Kaler and myself, and Eric's postdoc, Trini Raghavan. Beth is at uh, Helene Curtis, now Unilever, and Trini's a professor at the University of Maryland. And by the way, our postdoc, Matt uh, Liberatore, there is now professor at Colorado School of Mines, and Florian uh, is a uh, Humboldt scholar from, from Germany. Anyways, so by using these techniques, we see changes in the neutron scattering that are associated with changes in rheology, changes in material structure, and we've been investigating something. I'll just try to show you this little video clip here if it works. So what you see is they're stirring this apparently clear liquid, and it actually phase separates when you stir it, which is an interesting thing where thermodynamics and rheology and non-equilibrium sciences come together. And this turns out to be actually pretty important if you're a company like Unilever making uh, products that are based on these surfactant materials. Okay. Let's see if I can get this thing to come back. We're then applying this back to the, using this technology to help us understand these shear thickening fluids better. Uh, this is done with Jack Gillespie and uh, Amanda, who's from the Composite Center. It's also a grant through the Army Research Office that involves the uh, Historical Black College and University of Tuskegee and Purdue University as collaborators and some of the undergrads that you met before. And the idea is to look at these hydroclustered states and structures using the neutron scattering technology, understanding the rheology better and fine tune and, and really develop better materials as we go along. Uh, the other area that I mentioned at the very beginning that I was working in were polymers. And we started working on the liquid crystal polymers, but that took me to dendromers. And that took me to this very interesting project, which I'll just highlight one slide on, because it's not only nanotechnology, but it has a biotech flavor to it. And this is with Thomas Jefferson University, with a lot of support from the Delaware Biotechnology Institute's uh, infrastructure. And the idea is that in the pancreas, cancer is generally fatal because you can't detect it early enough. And so Eric, Dr. Eric Wickstrom, who you see here at Thomas Jefferson, came up with a very interesting idea, and he needed a polymer scientist to work with him on it. And so the idea is to take these polymers that we've worked on in the past and put some biologically biorecognition molecule on here, which will pick up the fact that there are things in a the RNA in a, in a cancer cell that, that's specific to the cancer. And if we can bind to that and then label the molecule with gadolinium, we could pick it up in, M, in an MRI scan, which is a, a nice idea. And, and there's some idea that this is actually working. The graduate student, Armin Opitz, has been working on this. He's been doing molecular modeling. That's an actual model of what he synthesized along with the chemists up at Thomas Jefferson University. They've done efficacy studies in, in rat, in mice in this case. And in this case, they, they were radioactively labeled, which you wouldn't want to use on a person, but it's okay for a mouse. Uh, and, and what you find, <laughs> mice have a hard time. And uh, what you see here is a cancer tumor that's actually lit up because we've been able to bind this molecule to the cancer cells in the material. And it's, it's just the polymer science uh, applied to a biological problem. And part of it's using confocal microscopy and others to look at how these molecules move through the human body. This is, again, fluid mechanics uh, applied to the human body to understand where these molecules go. Do they get to the cancer cells in the first place in the tumors preferentially? OK. Other problems we're working on with uh, Dr. Raul Lobo and others in the department involve splitting oxygen from nitrogen from air. Very important uh, technology. The company Air Products up in uh, Pennsylvania does this for a living, among others. And what Raul and others have realized are the, these interesting carbon materials just like soot from your car, but a very special soot, which have a nanostructure to them. And because of that, they can sieve oxygen for nitrogen, which is generally fascinating. And through NSF funding, working with Professor Sandler and Doug Dorn in the chemistry department, who are experts in quantum mechanics, we're building a model and trying to understand this from a first principles molecular simulation. And the student working on that is Amit Kumar. That leads me to uh, a, a nice project that we've had for a number of years. I got a call from this gentleman. You may recognize John Boyer from, I was now emeritus, but was in our college of, is in our College of Marine Studies. And uh, he came, drove up to Newark one day and said, you know something about polymers. I was flattered by that. 
and they bought me lunch, and I was flattered by that. What I didn't know is it was going to cost me two years of my life, but they've been very interesting two years working uh, with John on this problem, and his student, who's now Dr. Tim Prozius, uh, there were two chemical engineering undergrads who worked on this, and I'd like to highlight their role because they took a class from myself and Fraser and Ann Robinson, which I'll tell you about next, and, and that enabled them to do some mathematical modeling and John's lifetime work on understanding how drought and turgor pressure, if you will, the pressure inside plants, regulates plant cell growth, boiled down to looking at some interesting polymer incorporation into plant cell walls. And I, sorry, John, I don't have more time to go into it, but it's been a very interesting problem. And we've been doing some, some mass transfer modeling associated with that and helping with some of the experiments. It's been an interesting experience. Now, uh, and a large part of the audience turns out to be from Darien Road here, which is interesting. Uh, uh, and uh, two of my neighbors, Fraser and, and Ann Robinson, uh, they could, were working and convinced me to join them working on this book project, the book club uh, that we have. Uh, two undergrads, Pat Schilling, who's now working for Merck, and Matt Mishay uh, helped a lot with this, as well as many, many grad students, some of you who are here, uh, teaching fellows on that. And we're happy to report that you can actually buy this book in the bookstore, right? At least the first part. Uh, and this is a class that we teach the juniors. And I'm very proud that many of those juniors have gone on to work on these research projects that I've, I've shown you using hopefully what, we hopefully what we taught them there and also providing feedback for the textbook. Okay, last, last example. I have to uh, mention some family members too. Uh, this is my Aunt Louise, who actually arrived an hour ago from Buffalo, which is no easy feat in January. Uh, of, uh, and so here you are. And she also visited us in Rome when I was on sabbatical. That's a no very nice thing of this university. They allow you to go on sabbatical. And if you think about how the Romans or things were engineered in ancient times, this Colosseum was built brick by brick. Uh, those of you who like Dan Brown books, on the other side of the Tiber River in um, uh, Rome is the Castillo d'Angelo which I just slaughtered in bad Italian. But if you look, this was built, this is my wife, by the way, in front of the Taj Mahal. These buildings, these monuments to architecture were built brick by brick by tens of thousands, literally tens of thousands of people over 10 to 100 year period. And if we want to do something in nanotechnology, such as build materials like this, which are a photonic material made of, of as Carl Sagan would say, billions and billions of tiny particles, we're not going to be able to do this brick by brick. It'll never happen. And so the idea is to learn how to do something called self-assembly. And nature does this very well, but nature takes years to develop things by self-assembly. And so the idea is to direct this using electrical and optical fields. That is, as engineers, do what nature does, but do it quickly, right, in hours rather than, than centuries. And so I'll just show you briefly this little uh, uh, video here which is showing uh, some work that comes out of Eric Kaler's group, and, and I'll show you some of the players in that, and Orlin Velov's group, where you see what the, the laser beam is, is going through this material. And what we're after here are, is the analog of a transistor. You all have computers, you move electrons around with transistors, allows you to build circuits, but you'd like to build, for example, photonic materials, a computer that uses light, much faster, much more powerful, but you need the switches uh, to move the light around. And what you see here, are the, the Bragg scattering, the bright peaks of the laser beam going through the sample. And as we turn the electric field on and off, you see essentially this material um, uh, doing its thing and, and changing. And we're able to assemble the material. If you miss that part, I like stained glass. And the same type of technology is really important in stained glass. Stained glass is nothing more than nanoparticles of gold, and the different colors come from different sizes. And the interaction of the light with the nanoparticle gives rise to the color in stained glass. So in essence, we've been doing this type of nanotechnology since ancient times in stained glass technology. And so uh, this is a new endeavor that we're starting, as Eric mentioned, uh, through the auspices of the National Science Foundation. And it involves a very talented young scientist in our department, Dr. Eric Burst, uh, who's able to essentially uh, write on the head of a pin, if you will, uh, with colloids uh, using optical techniques. Uh, our dean, Eric Kaler, looking at some of the wires, and a former research professor and postdoc in Eric's group uh, with Bramy Lenhoff as well, uh, Orlin Veloff, uh, who's now got his own research group at NC State, and a good friend of ours at uh, Caltech, who you saw some of the simulation work e earlier, highlighted uh, Dr. John Brady. Okay, uh, I've gone on way too long. Uh, and I apologize to some of the people here who I work with and do projects with, uh, some of the people in, in biochemistry and material science uh, that I really don't have time to highlight all of the projects that are exciting that come out of the rheology and mass transport area. Uh, I do want to highlight, though, the fact that working at Delaware has a number of advantages. 
Uh, the first of those is the undergraduate program is very, very good in chemical engineering and very talented people. And I've highlighted a number of the people here, but they end up doing all sorts of crazy things, including people like Jess, who's off at the Peace Corps in the Dominican Republic, and students in various graduate schools and jobs and other places around the country. And I'm very grateful this is just some of the students that I've worked with uh, and published with over the last uh, 14 years here. Uh, my research group is here. They're scattered around. You've seen uh, some, but not all of them, highlighted in the pictures here. I'm very grateful uh, to work with them as well. Uh, they really keep you busy, keep you inspired, and, and, and keep you going. Uh, great postdocs as well, and, and you've met many of them. Uh, I also need to thank the, the university administration because all of this research and, and these ideas, as I highlighted in the beginning, the basic science and being able to turn it into a technology was done with the support of uh, the various chairs and colleagues that I have in the Department of Chem Chemical Engineering, our dean, uh, provost Dan Rich, who's here, uh, the off Office of the Vice Provost of Research, both uh, Fraser Russell and Carolyn Thorogood and others in the administration who've been extremely supportive and encouraging me to go on. Uh, the legal staff who's here uh, as well and helping me with the STF Armor Project. Uh, there are a lot of other people that I need to acknowledge, and I'm, I'm going to forget a few, of course. Uh, there are a lot of companies involved uh, with supporting this research as well as government organizations, the Army Research Lab. Um, I need to thank, too, uh, not only uh, uh, you know, the friends and colleagues that I have on this campus, but around the world, many of them uh, sent their regards on that. Uh, I'd also like to thank my parents who are here. I uh, came all the way from Wisconsin, believe it or not, to visit and, and uh, to, to hear this uh, lecture. Um, they've been supporting me from the very beginning on. It might come as no surprise to you that my father is actually a chemist, uh, so that, that maybe is logical. But what may really shock you is that my mother taught English uh, in high school. <laughs> and my only explanation is that I, in, in high school, you're not allowed to take a class from your parent, right? So I never had her for English, so sorry. You know? <laughs> so, um, and then last but not least, of course, my, my wife, Sabina. Uh, who we've been married for 15 years, and, and it's been a wonderful time. And she's been very supportive and, and has some knowledge about these things that keeps me on the right track with all of this. So thank you very much. And with that, I'd like to uh, close. And thank you very much, and be happy to try and answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you.